I'll just let people in as we go. All right, great, everyone. So uh, once again, for those of you who just joined, welcome to this uh, third uh, homomorphic encryption meetup. Um, you know, we're, we're just keeping things very friendly here. You know, this is not like a, an official conference or anything. It's really just a space where people can talk about homomorphic encryption, secure computation. Our first meetup, uh, Pascal Payet introduced the homomorphic encryption. Our second meetup, Yehuda uh, had introduced a multi-party computation. And we felt that uh, given the people attending, it made sense this time to do a deep dive on one of the homomorphic encryption schemes called TFHE, uh, of which Ilaria is uh, the co-author. Um, so today is gonna be more technical uh, than the previous meetups. Uh, so I hope you guys are gonna be okay with that. Um, but it's still going to be, you know, open for questions. If you have questions, oh, uh, near, yes, so it's going to be recorded. Everything is always recorded and posted on fhe.org. Uh, sorry if the website is not really designed or anything. We're just using it as a repository for the pictures of this meetup. Um, so as I was saying, uh, you can ask questions in the chat. Uh, Damien, myself, and some other people from Zama will be moderating. Uh, please do not unmute yourself and ask questions directly. Uh, Ilaria will be stopping at specific points to basically uh, answer questions. Uh, so don't worry, you don't have to wait until the end of the presentation to ask your questions. You can ask them as we go. And when we see that some of them are relevant to what she's saying right now, uh, then we're gonna uh, open up for questions. Um, we're going to try to keep things between an hour and an hour and a half. Um, and that's pretty much it. And uh, yeah, I guess, sorry, there, you know, we still haven't found a way to do virtual beers afterwards. Uh, so, you know, we'll, 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 we can hang out for those of you who want to stay here. Uh, are we going to be doing deep in the mat or in the code or both? Uh, well, Ilaria, I'll let you introduce. It's a surprise. <laughs> 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 I'll let you introduce your talk. All right, great. Um, so just a very quick word about Zama. Uh, so Zama is a homomorphic encryption startup that we've created here in Paris. Uh, we have been working on a new version of TFHE uh, that enables to do uh, quite a lot of things. Uh, I don't know if Ilaya is going to talk about what we do at Zama specifically or TFHE in general. Uh, but if you guys want to keep in touch, uh, we're very open, we're very easy to find. Everything we do is open source. Uh, everything we do is eventually published as well. Um, and we've been focusing exclusively on TFHE. Uh, Ilaria, floor is yours. Uh, okay, yeah, I'm unmuted. Thanks, uh, thanks Frank, for, for the, the introduction and um, yeah, for asking me to talk here. Um, so yeah, I think you said actually almost everything. Yeah, so we're gonna have a deep dive in TFHE. So it's the first uh, technical talk of the series. Uh, it's technical because we're gonna enter into the details, but I try to keep it as uh, easy as possible by putting as much images as I could and by putting formulas whenever it's really necessary. Uh, so I hope you will uh, you will um, follow easily. Um, as Ron said, I will stop from times to times in the different sections and I will ask if there are any questions. Uh, so we will take a few minutes to answer uh, the, the most uh, relevant questions and then we will move all the other questions at the beginning during at the end, sorry, during the Q and A. Um, okay, so um, how is this uh, presentation organized? It's going to be organized in five uh, big sections. Uh, I will start with a very, very quick uh, introduction on fully homomorphic encryption, uh, just to recall, uh, refresh our minds of what fully homomorphic encryption is. And then I will start the deep dive in TFHE. Uh, initially, I will talk about the ciphertext that we use in TFHE. Then I will start building what I call the building blocks, uh, which are in practice mixed operation between different types of ciphertext. And then uh, I will move to the bootstrapping. So I will explain how we do bootstrapping and I will then finish by um, talking about implementation and just a few applications. Um, okay, so let's start with uh, homomorphic encryption. So um, FHE, fully homomorphic encryption, I will call it a lot FHE, um, is a technology quite new, I would say, now it's starting uh, to date, um, that allows you as every uh, 
uh, encryption scheme to do encryption of messages. So in my in this case, the message is X, uh, which is going to be the, the plain text. And the encryption is represented by the blue box with a lock on the bottom. So whenever, whenever I will use this blue box with the lock, means that the message is encrypted. So um, FHE allows us to encrypt and decrypt the message, so to put the things in the box and to open the box. Uh, but it also has additional functionalities. So in, in particular, those functionalities are the possibility to do operations over ciphertext. So the easiest operation, of course, is the addition. So if we have two ciphertexts of X and Y, uh, we will add those ciphertexts homomorphically, which means that we are doing the operation on the ciphertext side. And the result is going to be a new ciphertext encrypting the addition between X and Y. And uh, in the same way, we can uh, we are able to do multiplication. So we take the two ciphertexts of X and Y, we multiply them homomorphically, and the result is going to be a new ciphertext encrypting their product. So uh, first thing which is important is that I noted that the addition and multiplication in the ciphertext space in a different color compared to addition and the, multi and the multiplication in the plain text space. And the reason is that uh, in the ciphertext space, uh, very often the addition and the multiplication are performed in a slightly different way than a normal addition or a normal multiplication. So we will see in the, in the rest of the presentation how this is done in TFHE. Um, so FHE means fully homomorphic, so potentially we want to be able to evaluate any possible function without any limitation, uh, composing addition, multiplication, doing something different. Uh, we're going to be able to encrypt a bit, integers, uh, real messages, and uh, we are able to do encryption by using secret keys or public keys. So in this presentation, I will just concentrate on the secret key version of the encryption scheme, uh, but we will use uh, some public keys for other uh, for additional functionalities if necessary. Um, OK, uh, now that we know what FHE is, uh, why FHE is important, why it's so interesting, and especially uh, where could it be used in uh, real life applications? So um, of course, like in this era where we all have uh, data on the cloud, um, it's uh, of a monomorphic encryption can be a very, very nice tool to protect our privacy. So imagine that we have the two parties, so us, the users uh, that are represented by this uh, computer, have some data that I will call M in the slide, and uh, there is this cloud provider that is offering some sort of service. It can store our data or it can perform computation on our data, do just a search on our data. So the idea is that we send our data to the cloud, the cloud will store it, we've performed this uh, search, so apply, apply functions, and it will send us back the function f, uh, f of m. The problem is that the data uh, very often is, uh, is sensitive. So imagine uh, uh, our medical data, some genomic analysis, or uh, financial data, and so on. Uh, we don't want for a, a cloud provider that we potentially don't trust to see uh, our, our data, our sensitive data. And so in this case, homomorphic encryption is very, very nice because it allows us to add this nice layer of encryption. So it protects uh, with this green box um, our data. And uh, at the same time, uh, will allow the cloud to uh, be able to perform the same uh, operation that it did before. So to ensure the same functionality that it uh, provided before and to send us back the results are still encrypted. So in the entire process, the message and the result are going to be encrypted and only the user, which is the owner of the secret key, will be able to open the, the boxes to retrieve the information. So in practice, the cloud learns nothing about the client data. Uh, there are no data breaches because even if somebody um, breaks into the cloud, it will find just uh, encrypted data, so it will not uh, see what is the actual data inside. And also the uh, location of the server will be irrelevant. Um, so in, the server could be located everywhere in the world and whatever the privacy regulation in this uh, state are, uh, we will not care much because uh, in any case the data will be encrypted and so nobody could access this if not the owner of the secret key. So just to give an example of a fun function that the cloud will evaluate, imagine that you have your picture, you want to encrypt it because you don't want the cloud to see a picture of yourself. And uh, imagine that the, the service you want to you wanna ask for is to apply a, um, a funny filter. Uh, in this case, I will use the filter cowboy hat, 
well, the cloud will be able to apply the filter cowboy hat on your picture without seeing the picture. So it will send you back the final result and the final result will be your picture with a nice cowboy hat in the end. And the cloud was able to do this without seeing the picture that you sent to him, to it. Um, okay, this looks actually very nice and very, very good for privacy, for the privacy of our data. However, it comes with a price and it comes with a, a certain cost. And the cost is due to something that we will call noise in the rest of the, of the talk. So remember, in a few slides before, I said that we can do additions and multiplication on ciphertext. Uh, what I didn't say before is that uh, at the, fir the first time we encrypt uh, our ciphertext in homomorphic encryption, we add uh, some uh, amount of noise. This noise is something that needs to be there for security reasons, so it cannot be, uh, we cannot get rid of it, at least uh, right now. Um, and I will measure this noise by using these little thermometers that I will put next to every ciphertext. So at the beginning, as I said, the noise is very little, the thermometer signals that the noise is low. But what happens when we do the operations? So when we do the additions and the multiplication, the noise will grow. And especially when we do the multiplication, the noise will grow a little bit more than the addition. And this is actually a bit painful because if the noise reaches this red limit that I put in the thermometer, uh, then we could not anymore decrypt correctly. So the noise will impact uh, and uh, it's the message and will compromise the message. So if the noise passes this limit, this red limit, a correct decryption is not possible anymore. So this problem was, uh, was uh, an actual problem and was preventing to do homomorphic encryption before 2009. And in 2009, actually, a, a researcher from uh, IBM at the time, uh, Craig Gentry, uh, found a, a solution which is called bootstrapping. So bootstrapping is used to uh, deal with the noise and to reduce the noise when uh, it starts growing too much. So I will, I will explain bootstrapping very, very quickly, the general idea of bootstrapping with images. And then in, later in my, in my talk, I will talk about the bootstrapping of TFHE in detail. So in there, we're gonna do a very deep dive in the bootstrapping. So the bootstrapping idea is the following. So you start with a ciphertext of X with an encryption of X and the noise has reached this maximal limit. So this means that at this point, we're not able to perform any other uh, homomorphic operation. So we need to stop uh, or we need to reduce the noise. So there is generally one simple way to reduce the noise, which is just decrypting. Why? Because decryption means opening the box. And if you open the box and take the message out, well, the noise will go away with the box. Unfortunately, to decrypt, or actually the reality is that to decrypt, you need uh, a secret key. But you cannot give your secret key to the cloud to refresh the noise because otherwise, what was the meaning of encrypted in the first place? And so the idea of Genfrey is a, a little bit more, um, it's, it's very smart. Uh, it tells you, well, let's bring, let's take this uh, cipher text, which has lots of noise, and let's put it inside a green box. So this green box, again, is a fully homomorphic encryption scheme. Uh, and putting the blue box with the noise inside the green box doesn't change anything in terms of the noise of the blue box. However, since this is a fully homomorphic encryption, uh, the green box will come with some little noise, which is uh, measured by this, uh, this thermometer next to the green box. And now what we want to do is to open the, green, the blue box inside the green one, which means in practice decrypting the blue box. As I said before, to open the blue box, we need a blue key. And so Gantry says, okay, let's give this blue key, but encrypted inside a green box. So we will call this encryption of the secret key a bootstrapping key, and this is a public key. It doesn't compromise security. And uh, now that we have uh, the blue box inside a green one and the blue key inside of a green box, we can perform homomorphically the decryption of the blue box, and the result is going to be just an encryption in the green box of the plain text X. And what is interesting is that the noise, the measure of the output, of course, has increased a little bit compared to the original noise in the green box. But if you, if you see in here, there is still a little bit of space to perform more homomorphic computation. So in practice, 
by using bootstrapping, we can do homomorphic computations and bootstrap as soon as the noise grows. We will have a little bit space, we will do again computation, and as soon as the noise reaches the limit, we will go back to the bootstrapping. So chaining uh, um, operations and bootstrapping allows us to evaluate potentially any possible circuit and not having any limit uh, in, uh, in the number of operations that we can perform. Unfortunately, bootstrapping, even if it's a very, very nice technique, is the most costly technique in homomorphic encryption. And so the question now is, do we need to bootstrap all the time or, or we can avoid bootstrapping from time to time? Well, the answer is it depends on the circuit you want to evaluate. So if the circuit that you want to evaluate is small, and especially if it's known, so you know how many operations need to be performed inside, then you will use what we call a leveled approach. If instead the circuit is very deep, so you have to do many, many operations and uh, uh, or it's just unknown by the person that generates the secret key, uh, then you will use what we call a bootstrap approach. So level appro approach means that you will avoid the bootstrapping as much as you can. So you will, um, if you know the function you want to evaluate, you will count how many operations do you have and you will fix the parameter in order to fit this number of operation inside the amount of noise that you're given. Of course, you have to consider that the largest is the circuit, the largest will be the crypto parameters and also the computation will be uh, slowest. So the more operations you have to do, the more is going to be costly, uh, not just because you do more operation, but because the operations become more costly. Um, and of course, like the circuit must to be known uh, in advance. So if you have, uh, as I said, like uh, a use case where your circuit is small and you know it, well, level, uh, the level approach is, uh, is very nice. However, if you want to use a, a more flexible solution or your circuit is deep, then you will use bootstrapping. So you have no limitations in the number of operations you can do, and then you will need to bootstrap from times to times. Okay, so what is user actually nowadays? Um, do we use the one approach, the other? Do we use both? Um, well, I, I will try to explain by using this, uh, this timeline that is very, very summarized. So not all the papers appear in here, but like the, the main ones, I would say. Um, so if we, if we think about homomorphic encryption, when we heard about homomorphic encryption for the first time, it was in 1978 where three, when three researchers called Rivest, Adleman, and Dertuzos start talking about privacy homomorphisms. Unfortunately, the problem was very hard to solve. Finding a solution was very hard. And for 30 years, nobody was able to find a fully homomorphic encryption solution until 2009 when Gentry proposed the bootstrapping. So after Gentry presented the bootstrapping, research started uh, producing a, a lot of very nice results. So we start in 2010 with a result of, by DGHV. So DGHV is the name of the authors, Van Dijk, Gentry, Halevi, and Van Kutanathan. So the scheme DGHV is very, very nice, very easy to explain, actually. Um, and, uh, and it's a scheme that uh, um, does operations over the integers. Uh, so this is not used in, uh, in applications today, but it's, uh, I, I really love the scheme because it's to explain homomorphic encryption is the nicest scheme that you can find. Um, then in 2011, there is a, one scheme called BGV, which is the first scheme based on, L, on the problem LWE, the first fully homomorphic encryption scheme based on the problem LWE. So LWE is a problem pro proposed by uh, Regev in uh, 2005, if I remember correctly. And uh, the scheme TFHE is based on LWE. So we're going to talk about LWE in a bit later in the, in the slides. And then in 2012, we have another approach based on Entru, um, which I think nowadays has some little, um, there's some little security issues, but it was a very, very nice solution. And uh, in 2014, we have another scheme that is based on LWE, which is the GSW scheme. So um, we're gonna, the, the schemes that are most studies now, studied nowadays are the ones based on LWE. So the BGV branch, I would say, and the GSW branch. So BGV um, sees appearing another variant in 2012, which is called BFV, while GSW sees another variant in 2014. So in 2014, we have few. 
um, which proposes a very fast bootstrapping for the GSW based on GSW. Um, and so in practice, now we see that we have two branches. The first one, the BGV branch that is using more a leveled approach because bootstrapping is extremely costly. And the GSW branch that is using a fast bootstrapping that allows the bootstrapping to be used as much as we want. So in the BGV branch, we see also CKKS, which is a very famous scheme used nowadays, while in the GSW branch in, uh, in 2016, we see appearing at TFHE. So TFHE is, of course, what we're going to uh, check today in detail. So initially, it starts as an improvement of the few bootstrapping, and then TFHE develops many other functionalities. Unfortunately, today we, are, we will not have the time to see all the functionalities, but we will see a little bit the most important basic functionalities. Okay, so I will stop here for a minute if we have any, any questions. Um, so there are some questions about the bootstrapping, gent gentry's bootstrapping. Maybe um, we can uh, go back to this slide and uh, yeah, sure. more details about the, the second box, the green one. So what is the question? Um, so it, uh, how are we sure that the server doesn't have access to the data when we do this operation, for instance. Oh, because everything is encrypted. Like we never exit from a, a box. So when, when I represent a box, it means that there is an encryption layer. Uh, if your encryption scheme is secure, the server is not supposed to break it. And uh, during the encryption, we never exit from a box. So we always are, we are always protected by a layer of encryption. So we, we are sure that the server is not able to see in any moment of the process the, um, uh, the data. Does this answer the question? Um, maybe I can ask. Yeah, sure. Uh, it seems that when we start the bootstrapping, we are having uh, it's inside the blue box. Yes. But at the end of the bootstrapping, we have it's inside of a green box. Yes. But in order to compute, continue the computation, we need it in a blue box again with less noise, right? We put it in a green box with less noise, yes. But, but the computation is done inside the blue box, not, in, not inside the green box. It's done inside the green box, actually. So the, the computation, the, the operation that we evaluate is the decryption which means open in the blue box, but it's done always inside the green box. So we yeah, never yeah. exit the green box. Right, but, but what, I, I, what I, I think what we wanted is to get uh, an X inside the blue box. And by the end of the bootstrapping, we, have, we want to have again, X inside the blue box, but with less noise. But we end up with X inside the green box. With well, that's nice. Yes, so this is not a problem. In the green box means that there is encrypted with a different secret key. Um, so uh, the, the secret key actually can be the same. The blue box and the green box might be the same encryption scheme. And we will see later that it's very easy to go back to the, to the blue key, even if we are in the green box. So it's, uh, going to the green is not a problem. The green could be actually the same as the blue. Uh, I just put it in color green to make the distinction between the, the, the two boxes. Okay, that that's answered the question. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the question. Damien, do we have another one or should I continue? Um, someone asked uh, about those two keys, the blue and the green. Mm -hmm. uh, who do they belong to? They both belong to the owner of the, the data. And are they different? Uh, not necessary. We can choose them differently or we choose the same. In case we choose the same key, we talk about circular security, um, which says that encrypting a secret key with um, herself is not dangerous for, um, for security. It's said very, very, um, uh, how can I say, uh, not formally, this is the definition of circular security. So yeah, using the same key, the, the blue key equal to the green key is not a problem. Yeah, and someone asked how is it not leveled? Uh, so is there a way to go back to the blue, blue key homomorphically? Yes, we can do what we call a key switching, 
uh, and we will see it's a it's a very easy operation it adds a little bit of noise but um, that we can uh, estimate so yeah we can go very easily back to the blue key but we need another public key that is called key switching key i think mm -hmm. okay so i continue mm -hmm. okay should i yeah, I mean, if you're going to talk about key switching later, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I will talk about it later. Explains. Don't worry. OK, so let's now start the, the deep dive. And we start by talking about TFHE ciphertext. So um, in TFHE, we use three type of ciphertext. Um, the first one is called the LWE. LWE exactly as the problem LWE, because in practice, we're using the problem LWE to encrypt the, cipher, to encrypt the message. So what are LWE ciphertext? Uh, they are ciphertext encrypting one single message that can be a bit, a modular integer, or a real in a fixed interval. So um, the ciphertext uses to be encrypted a secret key, uh, which is a, a little vector containing n elements. And those elements are bits, so they are random bits. Um, the fact of using bit is not mandatory. We can use also different type of, uh, of secret keys. We can use ternary, we can use uh, uh, Gaussian keys, but for, the, for this presentation, I will concentrate on binary keys. So how do we build the ciphertext? So in practice, how does the, the cipher, how the ciphertext is built? Um, so it's gonna be composed by uh, n plus one elements. The first, uh, N elements are called the A0, A, N minus one. And then there is this element B. So the A elements are just random integers in ZQ, uh, so numbers modulo Q. And uh, the, the last element B is built as the product between the A elements with the, the elements of the secret key, uh, to which we add a small error, and then the message multiplied by this delta, which is a scaling factor. So the error is uh, um, Gaussian, so it's chosen according to a Gaussian distribution. So again, uh, random elements A, we multiply those random elements by the key and we add some error, then the message and we obtain B. Um, so how do we decrypt? If we know the secret key, of course, we need the secret key to decrypt, we can just compute B minus A times S. This will result in delta M plus the error, and then we will just do a rounding to obtain the message. So um, this rounding is a very, very easy operation. And we will try to understand how does it work uh, in this slide. So um, let's try to, to make this uh, very visual. Uh, is, this is just a toy example. This is not using true uh, real world parameters, but it's giving you a hint of what is going on. So when we work modulo, modulo Z in, in ZQ, in practice, it's like we're working on a discretized torus. Uh, so the torus is uh, this nice circle. As you can see, we have zero in the bottom. Then we start increasing one, two, three, blah, 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 blah. And then we arrive to 61, 62, 63. So Q is equal to 64. So as soon as we reach 64, in practice, we go back to zero. This is the idea of the reduction modulo Q. And uh, in practice, if we can encrypt, uh, if we can use, if we use a Q equal to 64, means that we have six bits of information that we can uh, use. Um, and then we choose P, uh, where P is the number of plain text that we want to encrypt. In my toy example, are going to be four uh, elements. And uh, in practice, this means that we have two bits of information. And delta is just a ratio between Q and P. Um, so to visualize those quantities, uh, P is the number of possible messages uh, that, we can, uh, uh, that we can encrypt. So just one of those two messages can be encrypted in one ciphertext, but we have four possibilities for the message. Uh, so in practice, since we have four possibility means that we have two uh, bits of information that could be encrypted and we will encrypt it in the most significant bits of our uh, ciphertext. Uh, and delta just uh, uh, indicates the distance between one message in, uh, in ZQ and the next one. So the messages will be separated by this quantity delta of elements. Uh, so as we said before, we want to compute delta M plus the error. So the error, of course, must be limited. Uh, and it's limited by delta over two. 
So this means that in practice, we put the error in the least significant bit of our ciphertext. And in the figure, in the, in the wheel, let's say, um, the, the red bars that you see in the middle tells you that like the error that you add to a certain uh, plain text cannot pass uh, the, red, uh, the red boundary. Uh, so maybe let's just do a, a very quick uh, example. Let's say that we want to encrypt the message free. So the message free will be encoded by delta M, which is equal to 48 in our case. So it's here in our torus. And uh, in practice, it will appear that number three will appear in the most significant bit in the, in the binary decomposition. And then we will add some error, as we said. So the error must be smaller than eight in absolute value. In this case, we choose uh, an error equal to five. It will appear in the least significant bit. And so it will, it will be encrypted in a value 53. So 53 appears in here in the torus. So when you decrypt, as in the slide before, you compute B minus AS and you find this delta M plus E. So knowing delta M plus E, retrieving M is very easy. Why? Because you will just round delta M plus E to the nearest message possible, which is delta times M. And then by knowing delta times M, retrieving M is uh, it's, uh, straightforward. OK, uh, so as I said, this is just a toy example. In practice, we will not going to use a Q equal to 64, but more Q equal to 2 to the power of 32 or Q to the power of 64. Um, so these are the, the, the parameters that we generally use with TFHE. OK, so we are talking about homomorphic encryption. So we are expecting uh, some homomorphic operations. Uh, so with LWE, you can do uh, additions. So you can just add the two ciphertexts together by simply adding the A parts and the B parts. And the result is going to be an addition between the message uh, in the first one and the message in the second one. And uh, by extension, you can also do a multiplication by a constant integer. Again, by simply multiplying this, uh, the A part and the B part by this integer, you will obtain a ciphertext encrypting the integer times your message. Um, unfortunately, we cannot do this easily a multiplication. So to see a multiplication, we will need to wait a little bit longer. So uh, the second side, so the LWE was the first type of ciphertext that we use. The second ciphertext is ring LWE. So ring LWE does not encrypt only one message. It encrypts a polynomial containing n coefficients, and every coefficient is a message as in LWE. So it can be a bit, an integer, a real. So we encrypt a polynomial. So we have space for n coefficients in the polynomial. So again, the secret keyword that we choose now is not a vector, but is more a polynomial containing uh, coefficients that are again extracted, uh, are again binary. Uh, this is not mandatory. The coefficient could be also ternary Gaussian, but in the rest of the slide, I will concentrate on the binary distribution. And the ciphertext is encrypted in a very, is, is built in a very similar way as, as LWE. So you have an A part and a B part. A and B this time are polynomials. A, the A polynomial is uh, uh, uniformly random. So all of these coefficients are random integer modulos at Q. And uh, the B part is built as the, in the same way as before. So now we are multiplying polynomials. So we will do again A times S. You will add an error, which is Gaussian. Uh, and uh, you will add delta times so your message. So right now, instead of before there were scalars, now we're working with polynomials. And again, how do you decrypt? In the same way as before, if you know the secret key, you compute B minus A times S. And this will give you in output delta M plus the error. And you will round to obtain uh, the message M. So again, as before, knowing delta M plus the error allows you to easily uh, retrieve the message M um, in the same way as we did before. So now, instead of having just a single wheel, you imagine that there is a wheel in every coefficient of your polynomial. So if you understood how we found the message before, well, here you have to repeat just n times. And again, what are the optomorphic operations that we can do? We can do addition and we can do multiplication this time times a constant integer polynomial. And the operation is performed in the same way. Addition is done by adding the A elements and the B elements 
in your ciphertext. And the multiplication is simply done by multiplying your integer polynomial by the A and the B part. And this will give you an output a ciphertext encrypting uh, gamma, the polynomial times M. And the last but not least, the third type of ciphertext that we use in uh, TFHC is called the ring GSW. Uh, so similarly to ring LWE, it encrypts a polynomial containing N coefficients. And uh, the secret key is the same as a ring LWE ciphertext. So again, a polynomial with binary coefficients. But now the ciphertext is a little bit more complex. So we will represent it as a three-dimensional matrix. Uh, so the matrix is composed by, let's say, different layer in, uh, in the depth. Uh, the number of layers is exactly L. And uh, in the front, every single layer is composed by uh, four polynomials. Uh, two in the first line and two in the second one. So those polynomials in each line, every one of those polynomials of, of those pairs of polynomials is a ring LWE encryption. So the second type of ciphertext that we saw before. And what is the encrypting uh, this uh, ring LWE encryption? Well, in the first line, we are encrypting the message mu times the secret key times this fixed quantity Q over beta J for j that goes between 1 and l. And in the second line, we're encrypting the message times a q over b beta j, again, not the secret key in this time. So uh, mu times beta j in both, but in the first one encrypted times minus the secret key. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, so it looks more complex than the others, but this nice, uh, this more complex structure allows us to do more operations than before. So again, uh, we can do addition, we can do multiplication by a constant polynomial. The story is always the same. You simply add the A terms and the B terms, or you multiply the constant integer polynomials by the elements. But now with ring GSW, you can also do a multiplication, which is different from the other two previous ciphertexts. So how the multiplication is performed? I mean, it's not that straightforward. It's not hard, but it's not... Uh, um, immediately um, seeable. Um, so again, you have two ciphertexts, uh, one encrypting mu, one encrypting mu prime, and you want to compute a new ciphertext encrypting the product. This multiplication is going to be done in two steps. The first one is called the decomposition. So you will take the first ciphertext, only the first one, and you will, let's say, let's concentrate on just one layer of the ciphertext, so one uh, four times four, two times two matrix. So let's not consider the, the, the other in depth. And what you will do, you will decompose every single polynomial in a certain amount of uh, small polynomials, in, part, in practice, L small polynomials. So AJ here will be decomposed into L small polynomials in here, BJ in L small polynomials in here, and so on. Uh, so the decomposition is a very trivial operation. It can be done uh, very easily, and it's quite fast. And then we pass to the second step, and the second step is a matrix dot product. So you will take this decomposition, and you will multiply it times, right now, the second ciphertext. And this multiplication is a matrix multiplication with uh, a dot product in practice, so you will sum uh, the, the polynomials that you multiply, will give you an output four polynomials, which represent one of the layers in the output ciphertext. So if you repeat these operations for all the layers in the first uh, uh, encryption, you will obtain all the layers in the output uh, uh, matrix. And this output matrix will uh, encrypt the product between mu and mu prime. So it looks like a very complex operation, but it's actually very easy to, to implement. Uh, and, uh, and it works. Uh, I will not give the proof of why it works. Uh, you will have to trust me, or I will give you some sources in the end, uh, so you can check by yourself if you don't if you don't believe this work. Um, okay, so this brings me to the last slide of this section, which is a, a summary, just to to have a visual uh, overview of what we did until now. So even if you did not understand all the details, this is the information you have to record from this part of the talk. Um, so we have three types of ciphertext, LWE, ring LWE, and ring GSW. 
the ciphertext tall w is composed by a vector and uh, a little element b and we can perform additions and constant multiplications ring w is composed by two polynomials we can do addition and constant multiplication ring jsw is more complex you have this three-dimensional matrix and you can do in this case additions constant multiplications and multiplication between ciphertext uh okay i will stop for a second before proceeding to the next section uh if there are any questions um yeah there was a question about the noise if it's negative in the slide you know with the big clock mm -hmm. with the big noise. yes and, let me go back um, more precisely with the bit representation yes uh, how does it work if the the um, the, the error is negative Yes, so if the error is negative, of course, it can be negative. The important thing is that the, the, the absolute value is, uh, uh, is smaller than, uh, than delta over 2. In case it's negative, you should see appearing a bit of uh, sign in, this, uh, in here instead of the 0. And uh, yeah, it will still appear in the least significant bits. So it will be you, are, you will be you will still be able to decrypt even if the noise is negative. This is not a problem. I don't know if this answered the question. Um, oh, yeah, that's fine. Oh, okay, go on. Okay, I continue, I go to the next session. No, I think someone was uh, started to ask a question. Ah, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't understood. Yes, please go ahead. Hello. I, I okay. So there is a question about uh, RLWE. Yes. Um, is RLWE simply repeating LWE over the coefficients? If not, is the harness assumption different than LWE? Uh, no, the harness assumption is. I mean, you have the ring LWE assumption, uh, which is uh, very similar to LWE. Uh, is in practice the, the same problem, but on rings. Um, so the, the plain text, you can see it's as a repetition of LWE plain text, but the cipher text is way more compact. So in LWE, to be clear, the cipher text was uh, uh, n plus one scalars, let's say. Those guys are elements uh, uh, in ZQ. Uh, I think I, I said it here, yes. So here you have like n plus one elements, uh, and you can encrypt a single message. In Ringle WE, uh, you have um, two polynomials, each of them with n coefficients. So you have two n coefficients, but instead of encrypting just, let's say, two messages, you can encrypt n messages. So it's, uh, it's uh, let's say it's way more compact that, than uh, LWE, you can factor you can pack more messages in a single in a single cipher text. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I might go on with the presentation. If we have any other question, I think we can take it at the end. Okay, so um, now we enter into maybe one of the most complex part of the presentation so uh, brace yourself but don't be too scared i will try to keep it as easy as possible if possible uh, so this part is building blocks so in the previous section we saw operations that we can perform in every single ciphertext now we're going to start mixing them together so we're going to start making the different ciphertexts interact between each other so the first operation that we have is called the external product so it's very similar to the multiplication in ring JSW, but it's, uh, let's say, easier than that one. So the external product is a, is a multiplication between a ring LWE and a ring JSW. So two different ciphertexts are multiplied together. The output is going to be a ring LWE again, and it's going to encrypt the product between mu and m. So how is it um, performed this operation? Well, it's very easy. It's, it's very similar to the product of ring JSW. You would start with a decomposition of the first ciphertext, so the LWE, ring LWE ciphertext, sorry. Again, you will decompose the A uh, 
um, element into L small polynomials, the B polynomial in L small polynomials. And then you will perform this time a vector matrix dot product. So instead of having a matrix product, you will have a vector matrix product. So it's way smaller. Uh, and what you will obtain in output is two polynomials that are exactly the result you were looking for. So instead of doing like the operation for all the layers, as we did in ring GSW, here you have just uh, um, one operation to do, like one decomposition and one vector matrix dot product. So it's easier, um, it's faster, and it gives you as well the product between the two messages. But this time you can uh, multiply two different ciphertext types. So the external product is very important in TFHE because it allows us to uh, define another nice building block, which is called the CMUX, which stands for Control MUX. So the MUX gate, it's a, it's a clear text gate that is well known, and it's represented in the slide by this, uh, this figure. So it takes in input three elements, B, D0, and D1, and depending on the value of B that can be zero or one, it selects one of the two. So if B is equal to zero, the output is gonna be D0. If B is equal to one, the output is gonna be D1. Uh, so this operation can be performed in clear text by simply evaluating this little equation. If B is equal to zero, this term will disappear and you remain with D0, which is what you were looking for. If B is equal to one, you will remain with D1 minus D0 plus D0, which gives you D1 as you wanted. So now how can we evaluate this nice operation, which is in practice is an if condition, if you want, um, in homomorphic encryption? Uh, well, we will be easily, um, we will be simply uh, encrypting the values D0 and D1 by using ring LWE. So the, the line, the two, uh, like the two polynomials, and we will encrypt the B, the bit that will select one of the two outputs by using ring GSW. And then we will perform this operation by just doing, instead of the multiplication, an external product, and instead of the subtraction and the addition, simply subtraction and addition between ciphertext, as we saw in the previous slides. And this will give us, in output, uh, uh, an encryption of DB, uh, which is D0 or D1, depending on the value of B, encrypted as a ring LWE. So this block is very nice and it's gonna be used a lot in, uh, in TFHE construction, especially of the bootstrapping. So keep this uh, building block in mind because you will see it a lot in the rest of the slides. Okay, so the first building block is the rotation. And I will start building the rotation by uh, increasing the difficulty little by little. So let's start from everything in clear text. So we wanna imagine that we wanna rotate a polynomial m of x of p positions. So m is going to be represented by this uh, polynomial, of course, m0, m1 times x to mn minus 1, xn minus 1, because we're working modulo xn plus 1. And the, what we want to extract is the, the coefficient mp. So we want to rotate this polynomial of p position in order to bring mp in the first position. Well, the operation is very easy. Um, it's simply a multiplication between m of x uh, times x to the power of minus p. So what happens if we do this operation? The coefficient mp will be brought in first position. So it will be in the coefficient x to the power of zero. The other uh, coefficients will follow in the order. And uh, uh, the coefficient that were before mp will appear at the end with a minus sign in front because we are working modulo xn plus one. So it's a very easy operation. It's just a multiplication with between a ciphertext, sorry, between a polynomial and a monomial x to the power of minus p. So now let's add a level of difficulty and let's try to rotate an encryption of m of x of p clear text position. So m of x is encrypted, p is known. Uh, m of x is gonna be encrypted with a ring LW. So the orange ciphertext composed by a and b. And again, the multiplication, the rotation is very easily done. It's sufficient to multiply each of the two uh, elements a and b by x to the power of minus p. And the result is gonna be uh, an encryption, a ring LW encryption of m rotated of x to the power of minus p. 
So again, very easy. Um, this operation doesn't add any noise. And it's, um, yeah, it, it can be easily performed. Uh, but now let's add another layer, layer of difficulty. And let's not only encrypt the M, but also P. So we want that P, the number of position that we want to use to rotate the M, is encrypted as well. So let's try to easy to make the game easier by uh, supposing that we know the binary decomposition of P. So we know P0, P1, P to the K. Uh, and let's suppose that those, this binary decomposition is provided as ring GSW ciphertex. Um, so now what to uh, remember the P elements are unknown, they are secret, so encrypted, while the um, two to the power of J is of course a constant and is well known. So now what you want to compute again is M times X to the power of minus P to perform the rotation. And M to the power of X, uh, um, M times X to the power of minus P can be developed in the way I wrote in the slides. And in practice, this is just equal to M times the single monomials, X to the power of minus P zero, two to the power of zero, blah, 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 X to the power of minus PK, two to the power of K. So let's concentrate on one of those powers, in particular, the power X PJ, two to the power of J. So let's just perform the multiplication between M and this X to the power of minus PJ, two to the power of J. So again, M is encrypted, P is encrypted. So let's try to understand what we want to find in output. So if P is equal to zero, what happened in here? Uh, here in the exponent, you have zero, X to the power of zero is equal to one. And so the output is going to be M. So if PJ is equal to zero, you want M in output. If instead PJ is equal to one in the power of X, you will have minus two to the power of J. And so the result you're looking for is M X to the power of two J. So maybe you, you have already the intuition, this is an if condition. And how do we evaluate if conditions with uh, one of the previous building blocks? by simply doing a CMUX. So the CMUX in this case, which is the if condition, will take in the zero input a ciphertext of M, in the input corresponding to one, a ciphertext of M multiplied times X to the power of two J, which is a clear text value, so the operations can be easily done. And it will take as a selector P to the J. And the result, the result sorry, is gonna be exactly M times X to the power of minus PJ two to the power of J, which, we, which was what we were looking for. So now if this step is clear, you, you can imagine that it's easy to um, build the rest of the, of the power to, to obtain X to the power of M times X to the power of minus P. It can be simply done by constructing a chain of simuxes one next to the other. So you will start by P0. So you put in input M and X to the power of minus one, two to the power of zero is one. You will obtain an output M0, which is M times X to the power of minus P0. And then you give M0 as an input to the following simux, which now is taking, uh, sorry, there is a typo in here. Here is P1. Um, you will obtain again M1, and you will continue until the end, until PK, to obtain exactly X to the power of uh, uh, M times X to the power of minus P. So you were able to perform a blind rotation, which is a rotation of an unknown polynomial by an unknown number of position P. Okay, so this I think it was the, the most complicated building block. So if you survived until here, congratulations. Uh, keep this building block in mind because it's going to be very useful. Um, we will see another two building blocks, but they are very, very easy. So the, the, the one we will see now is the sample extraction. So it's, uh, it's a building block that takes in input a ring LWE, encrypting a polynomial M of X, the ways build you already saw it before. And you would like to extract from this ring LWE one of his coefficients homomorphically. So you don't know M, you want to extract one of his coefficients and you want to extract it as a LWE. So in particular, to give an example, you want to extract the coefficient M0 to put it inside an LWE. So to put it as a message in a LWE. 
This operation is extremely easy. It's, uh, it can be done by simply rearranging the coefficients of uh, uh, the input ciphertext, the input ring LWE ciphertext in a very specific order. Uh, and by setting the output key as the vector, uh, simply by copying the elements of the secret key of the ring LWE. Uh, so it's, a, it's an operation that adds no noise and it's trivially performed by again, rearranging the coefficients of uh, the inputs into the output. And uh, of course, not only the coefficient zero can be extracted, all the coefficients could be extracted. Uh, it's sufficient to rearrange in an appropriate way the output coefficients. And then last the building block, but not least, is called the key switching. So uh, I already cited key switching before. So key switching is an operation that allows you to switch the key, as the term says. So imagine you have an input, an encryption of M with respect to a secret key S. So very small is my slide. In output, you can obtain an encryption of M with a different secret key S prime. So this operation requires a key switching key which is a public key that I will not detail how it's built, but it's a public key, very similar to the bootstrapping key, actually. Um, and uh, um, it doesn't only allow you to switch the key, but also to change parameters. So if you want to change the parameters, this could be done with the key switching. The key switching can be performed between LWE ciphertext, but also between ring LWE ciphertext in a very similar way. But it can also be used to um, switch from an LWE to a ring LWE, meaning that if you have, uh, in practice, it's a little bit the inverse operation if you want of the sample extraction. In the sample extraction, you extracted one coefficient of the ring LWE into an LWE. In the key switching, you can take an LWE um, ciphertext and put its uh, plain text into one of the coefficients of the polynomial. And more generally, you can pack many uh, LWEs into a single ring LWE. So you can put uh, many, many plain text of LWEs into the coefficients of a ring LWE thanks to the key switching. The key switching has many other functionalities that I will not detail. It allows you to evaluate a very regular function that can be public or private. We call this technique functional key switching. And uh, unfortunately, it increases the noise. So at the output, you will have a little bit more noise than before. But sometimes this change of key or change of parameters or packing and moving to a different ciphertext space, it's very important. So this was our last building block. Again, I have a slide to summarize everything that we saw. If something, some details before were missing, this is the information that you have to keep in mind to continue the presentation. So you have, uh, uh, we defined the external product, which we defined also the CMUX is an operation that makes an interaction between ring LWE and ring JSW, giving you in output a ring LWE. So pardon the error is not extremely precise, but it's just to give an idea of where the operation situates in the scenario. Uh, we can do a rotation, so we can rotate ring LWE ciphertext. We can do sample extraction, so extract one coefficient of the ring LWE into one LWE, and we can go back by using key switching if needed. So again, this is the last slide of this section. If there are any questions, I will take them now. Damien? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so people asked about semuxes and stuff. I think yeah. with Pascal we answered, but maybe there are some people with um, other questions and they can unmute themselves and sure. ask directly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Otherwise, we have a question here. Uh, mm -hmm. In concrete or uh, TFH in general, is it possible to also use key switching or another way to um, realize proxy re-encryption, uh, which means switching a, a ciphertext to a different secret key using another party public uh, key only? Okay, so you want to you wanna switch, so you want to move from a, a type of ciphertext to another. This can be done with key switching, but by using another party's public key. So I, if I understand correctly, you're talking 
about a multi-key scenario. Am I understanding correctly? Uh, yes, so there's um, kind of another party which also has a public key and a secret key. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, you want to encrypt it to the secret key of the other party uh, by only ah, using okay. its public only, key. Only the secret key of the other party. Yes, so the ciphertext okay. resulting should be encrypted under the secret key of the of the other party, okay. and uh, we can use the public key, for example, from the other oh, party. Okay, but the problem is that in input you have a, a ciphertext encrypting uh, encrypted with the secret key of the first party, let's say. Yes. So I would say that if you don't allow interaction from the first party, you cannot do this. I mean, um, what you are trying to do is kind of decrypting with respect to the first party and re-encrypting with respect to the second one. Uh, I suppose this will require interaction, and in any case, it, it's I would say it places itself in a multi-key setting. So multi-key is possible in TFHE, uh, but is not yet implemented in uh, in concrete. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Any other question? Yeah, someone asked about the uh, external product. Um, mm -hmm. Is the external product faster than multiplying two LWE ciphertexts? Uh, well, you cannot multiply. Uh, I, we didn't see the LWE multiplication. Um, so in the LWE multiplication, when you say multiplying two LWE ciphertext, I suppose you're thinking about maybe a BFV, BGV multiplication, something like this. Uh, so in case you want to do this multiplication, you need to do relinearization. So it's going to be uh, different steps. Um, it's a different uh, operation. Um, uh, I, I'm not so sure exactly which one is more costly. Uh, I would say they are about the same cost because the, um, uh, the external product um, uses the ring GSW, doesn't have key switching keys, relinearization key stories. Um, I, I would not be able to tell you exactly which one is the fastest. I would say the cost about the same. Of course, it depends also on the parameters that you instantiate with one and the other. Like if they have the same parameters, I would say the cost is very similar, but I, I will not be able to tell you which one is more faster than the other. Hope this answered the question. Um, what uh, order of polynomials can TFHE handle in practice? Yeah, so we use generally n equal to the, the most known parameters, I would say, are 2 to the power of 10 and 2 to the power of 11, uh, sometimes 2 to, power, 2 to the power of 12. So 10, 11, 12, I would say. Uh, 2 to the power of 10, 2 to the power 11, 2 to the power of 12 coefficients. So big N is going to be equal to this. I think we're good. OK, great. Uh, so I see by my counter that we are at 58 minutes already. Uh, so we're starting passing the hour. But this is the last uh, um, section. And this is the, um, I mean, the last intense section. Then it's going to be very fast in the end. So um, again, it's, uh, it's a very technical one. But if you recorded uh, the majority of things that I presented before, this should be easily to under easy to understand. So we're gonna start slowly. So what is bootstrapping? Uh, bootstrapping is the original goal, as I explained at the beginning of the slides, was to reduce the noise when it grows too much because the noise is compromising the messages. So we need to reduce this noise when it grows too much. Uh, in TFHE especially, we can bootstrap LWE ciphertext. So we will bootstrap the first type of ciphertext that you see in here. And how does it work, the bootstrap? Well, to bootstrap, you need to evaluate the decryption circuit. So remember, open the blue box. So in here, we want to open this blue box to get rid of the noise homomorphically. So we will never exit from a ciphertext, uh, um, uh, from an encryption layer, let's say. Uh, so how does it work, the decryption in LWE? As we saw before, it works in two steps. You start by computing B minus AS. B minus AS 
uh, gives you an output delta m plus e. And then when you have delta m plus e, you will round it, pass me the abuse of notation to obtain the message m. So bootstrapping wants to do this in order to have in output a ciphertext of the same type, so LWE ciphertext with less noise. So let's start by understanding how it's done uh, from the second point. So instead of starting from, uh, from point number one, I will start from point number two, and then I will go backwards. OK, so um, I want to compute the, delta, the rounding of delta m plus e. This is my goal. So let's start by the, the, the most uh, easy approach. Imagine that I know the message m. m, as I said before, at the beginning can be, let's say, p different values, so between 0 and p minus 1. So imagine that those values are encoded in a, in a polynomial that I'm here representing as a vector only uh, with the coefficients. So if I want to extract the message m, uh, imagine that is hidden here in the middle, uh, what can I do? It's simply rotating this polynomial by m position minus m position. And this will bring the message m in here. So I rotate on this side on the left, and I will find the m in the first place. So this is a very trivial operation, very easily performed. It's not what we're going to use. It's just to build the idea. OK, so uh, we don't have m. We don't know m. m is what we are looking for. We know instead that delta m plus e. Let's suppose that we know to compute delta m plus e. So delta m plus e is a value that is uh, between 0 and q minus 1, as we saw in the encoding at the beginning. So again, if I have uh, all the elements between 0 and this time q minus 1 in this nice vector, and I want to extract delta m plus e, what I do is simply to multiply this vector times x to the power of minus delta m plus e, which will bring this value that I also call the m prime in this first position. Again, multiplication moves, the rotation moves the coefficients on the left. Um, OK, so if I know delta m plus e, it's fine. But I want to I wanna starting from delta m plus e, I want to find m. So we're going to um, we're going to change a little bit the vector in input to our rotation. So instead of giving uh, the elements 0, 1, 2 to q minus 1, we're going to apply some redundancy in our table. So this means that we will do some repetitions in our table. In practice, we're going to, instead of having 0, 1 uh, to q minus 1, we're going to repeat the value 0 delta times, the value 1 delta times, up to the value p minus 1 delta times. Because remember, your message m is between 0 and p. So to, to see it more, I, again, we have a q values in here. And this is kind of a representation of the torus that we saw in the iconic part of TFHE. So the q elements represented in the, in the case, all the, all the cases, the q cases, represent all these little, uh, how can I call them, uh, tiffs of the wheel. Uh, each of them represent one of the elements in the wheel. The repetitions will represent the slices of the torus, which means that like, if you are in zero, uh, all the elements in the slice corresponding to zero will be repeated to form this, uh, call it mega case. All the elements corresponding to one will be repeated to, um, in a redundant way to have one and so on. Uh, and of course, why delta repetitions? Because delta is the amount of elements in every slice. So something that you might observe is that the zero case, the zero mega case, I didn't make it start from the beginning. I separated it from uh, one part in the beginning and one part in the end. This is exactly to, um, to reflect what is appearing on the torus. So, so um, if we start, uh, uh, the zero in here, as we said before, the mega case of zero is going on the positive way. So it's going in the growing part, let's say, of the, of the vector. But some coefficients corresponding to zero also appear in minus one, minus two, et cetera. So they will appear in the end part of the, of the, of the vector. So the mega case of zero will be split one part in the beginning and one part in the end. Um, 
And so what happens? What happens if, the, if you don't have any error uh, and you are in zero, you will fall exactly in the first case in the, in, in the vector. If you have a little bit of error, if the error is positive, you will fall in one of the following cases. But again, since there is repetition still containing a value of zero, if the error is negative, you will fall in one of the previews at the end. Uh, but again, since there is repetition, it's going to be encoding zero as well. So I'm going to call this, um, uh, this well, sorry, again. Um, uh, so instead of doing the rotation as we did before by using the Q different values, we're going to just use the redundancy. And again, as I was saying, if uh, uh, there is no error, I will fall in the middle of the mega case encrypting M. If there is an error, I will uh, move a little bit on the sides. So I will fall in one of the subsequent or previous cases corresponding to M. And so in this, in this way, we are evaluating the rounding of delta M plus E. Why? Because we give an input of delta M plus E, but we are extracting an output or, or better making appear in the first coefficient something that encodes M, which means so we are doing the rounding. Okay, so I will call this uh, uh, vector containing the mega cases V. So again, it encodes the, the different plain text uh, um, representation of the, all the possible messages. And so the goal is going to be to compute V times X to the power of minus delta M plus E, if we were able to compute the delta M plus E. Um, now, something that we need to observe is that in here, I'm supposing I'm able to use Q elements. Uh, but Q is a very big value in practice. So it's generally equal to 2 to the power of 32 and 2 to the power of 64. So using polynomials, because here what I'm representing is actually a polynomial uh, of this size is very, very impractical. And in practice, we want to use something smaller to make the computation uh, faster, more efficient. In practice, we're going to use polynomial of size n, where n is, as somebody asked right before, a value that is way smaller than 2 to the power of 32 or 64. It's generally 2 to the power of 10, 11, 12, not more than that. Uh, so we're going to need to encode this same information in something that is way smaller. And this, in practice, what it means that we'll only, we will only keep in our ciphertext the most significant bit which is where the information is stored. And we will just throw uh, away the last significant bits. This will make the noise grow a little bit, but something that we can uh, estimate. So again, we will use only the most significant bits of our ciphertext, and this operation will be extremely fast. OK, so now that we understood how we um, compute a rounding, Let's try to go back to the first step, which is computing delta M plus E. Um, so how do we compute delta M plus E? Remember that delta M plus E is equal to B minus A times S. So with a minus in front is minus B plus the product between A's and S, which extended is just minus B plus A0 S0 plus blah, 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 A N minus one S N minus one. So we want to compute uh, delta M plus E homomorphically. The values B, A are known because they are part of the ciphertext. The, value S, the values S are unknown. They are secret. So we're going to provide them as bootstrapping keys encrypted with um, ring GSW. So every single bit of the secret key is going to be encrypted by ring GSW. Again, inside we have bits. So the SIs are just zeros and ones. And so now we will see exactly how the bootstrapping of TFH is performed. So we start by setting our vector V containing these redundant messages. And we will start in the first step by computing a rotation of V of B positions. So in practice, in the computation, we're taking care of the minus B part. And then we will start little by little adding in the exponent the AIs times SIs. So since SI is an encrypted value, um, doing this computation means making a choice. If S is equal to zero, we have uh, uh, zero in the exponent. If S is equal to one, we will have A zero in the exponent. And we actually already saw this operation before. 
and it was during the blind rotation. So again, we will use the blind rotation in the same way as we did before. S0 is going to be the bit in input in the ring GSW is part, so the selector. And if S is equal to 0, we will keep V0. If X is equal to 1, we will uh, keep V0 times X to the power of A0 which is in practice, if you, if you want, V0 times X to the power of A0 S0. So we took care of the second part. We can iterate this process until the n, until A n minus 1 S n minus 1, by simply uh, doing a list of synopsis as we did in the blind rotation. And so the final result is going to be exactly what we expected, which is V, the original vector that we set in here, times x to the power of minus delta m plus e, as we wanted to compute. So this is what's the first step in practice. So to summarize, uh, the bootstrapping is taking in input a ciphertext of m, an LWE ciphertext of m, and is computing this blind rotation that um, rotates this uh, input vector of delta m plus e position in order to bring the mega case corresponding to the cipher, the plain text m in the first position. But now, I mean, if we go back for a second, what we wanted in output, we didn't want a ring LW encryption as you're seeing here. We want a LW encryption. So again, how can we go from a ring LWE to an LWE by extracting a coefficient? by simply doing a sample extraction. So we sample extract the first coefficient, which is the one encoding M in the mega case. And this is going to contain the plain text M, which was there in the beginning, but this time with less noise. So our goal of bootstrapping uh, has been achieved. There is just one little detail that somebody of you um, noticed in the first place. Here I have a secret key S. Here I have a secret key S prime. So how can I go back to S if I want to close the circle? By simply applying a key switching, which is the last building block that we saw in the previous uh, part. Um, and so yeah, this is in practice the bootstrapping of TFHE. Um, the bootstrapping of TFHE in this case, you see is just decreasing the noise, but it's actually able to have more functionalities than this. In practice, the bootstrapping is programmable, which means that not only is able to reduce the noise during the, the, the bootstrapping uh, operation, but is also able to evaluate a function at the same time. So how can we evaluate a function at the same time? We simply change the, the vector that we used at the beginning to do the operation, the bootstrapping operation. So instead of putting in the mega cases the value of zero, exactly zero or one or blah, 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 P minus one. We will put instead a value of F of a function F evaluated in zero, F evaluated in one, F evaluated in P minus plus one. So in, sorry, in practice, we are just putting in the test vector, in this vector V, a lookup table evaluation of all our possible inputs. And then what we do, we just give this B in input the bootstrapping, and the operation is going to be performed in exactly the same way. But this time, at the end of the blind rotation, what is going to appear in the first coefficient of the mega cases is f of m. And so we will extract f of m, which is the value of the function f in the input m. And so we evaluate the function m, f in the input m. So not only we decrease the noise, but we also evaluate the function. Um, so again, a slide to summarize everything. Um, we have the, our free type of uh, ciphertext. We saw in here that we can do bootstrapping. So remember, bootstrapping is the technique that reduces the noise. And I note the techniques to reduce the noise with this dashed arrow. So we can bootstrap LWE ciphertext. Uh, so we can go from LWE to LWE. Um, there exists another bootstrapping technique in TFHE, which is called circuit bootstrapping, that um, uses the bootstrapping itself to be performed. Uh, it's just a little bit more complex uh, and allows us to go from LWE to ring GSW again by reducing the noise. So not only reduces the noise, but allows us, allows us also to change the ciphertext space to ring GSW. So if we bring back all the, all the building blocks that we saw in the previous part, we see that actually we 
thanks to TFHE, we can go whatever we want uh, into the ciphertext space. So you can find actually an arrow that brings you whatever you want. If you want to go from LWE to ring GSW, ring LWE to LWE, and so on. So thanks to all these blocks uh, put to, brought together, you can actually um, have a, a large amount of possible operations that you can perform, and you can build whatever you want um, if you're able to combine them in the appropriate way. Uh, so to finish this section, and then I will take some questions, um, TFHE doesn't stop in here. Uh, unfortunately, like we have just one hour, one hour and a half of time, so we don't have time to go into the entire TFHE, but I think what we saw is actually the most maybe important part. But there are also other features that are presented by TFHE and that might be interesting to see. Uh, we can do, of course, gate bootstrapping, which is uh, um, the, the first thing TFHE improved. We can evaluate lookup table in a leveled way. We can evaluate fine deterministic weighted automata. Uh, we can use this fun homomorphic counter. Uh, we can do the circuit bootstrapping and we can do way more uh, operations. So if you're interested in knowing more about this uh, stuff, of course, we can talk about it in the, in the Q&A session, or I will give you just some, uh, um, some references so you can check if you're interested. So this finishes my fourth, fourth block. Um, the last session will be very fast, a section will be very fast, but I will take questions if there are any at this point. Yes, can I ask something? Uh, yes, it, sure. It, it, it seems that during the bootstrap, you, are, you have a, a, the, the, the polynomial V that has the encryption of all the possible uh, uh, symbols. Mm -hmm. And, and you choose one of them. Yes. Right. So, so, so it seems that the output of the output is is one of the, the number of possible uh, encryption of each symbol that you have inside V. So, if you do that many times, you will have you start to have verifications, and maybe you can you can extract the the information. Uh, it, I, again, can you can you repeat? I mean, you cannot really extract the information because you you will extract a ciphertext. So yes, you are extracting information, but this information is still hidden. So the but, person but that is doing that... this operation is not seeing anything. Is... Hello. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think that I'm asking the the, the ciphertext. Uh, has a has a reputation because the ciphertext is one out of of the, it is it, it's one of those ciphertext that that are encoded inside the the, the polynomial v, right? Yes. So so you have a finite number of of ciphertext. A finite number after of the, plain text, yes. Ciphertext after the bootstrap. I mean, you you no choose, no after you the choose... bootstrap you still have one ciphertext, a single one. Yeah, but... But but you have the, the one that come out of the polynomial V. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the entire polynomial V rotated is in one single ciphertext. It's not separated ciphertext. It's just one. Yeah, but let's say let's say you have in V, let's say a thousand uh, uh, ciphertext encoded. Doesn't plain text encoded. Yeah, you have let's say uh, four four plain text. Let's say, yes. let's say you have four four plain text and, and yes. you have a thousand uh, ciphertext of these four plain text. So right? what you're saying is that you have four mega cases, yeah. and they are encoded in a thousand coefficients. Right. So you have I don't know a thousand divided by four should be uh, two hundred and fifty. So you have two hundred and fifty times repeated zero, two hundred and fifty times repeated one, two hundred and fifty two, right. and two hundred and fifty three. Yes. So now after the bootstrap, I yeah. get one. I'll, let's say I, I boot up a symbol, a zero symbol, and yes. I get back one out of that two, 250 uh, zero, symbols. That yes. code, zero symbol. So yes. if I do that many times, then I'll see that I'll see that, that uh, maybe I'll, I can see a repetition inside this ciphertext and, and start well, to if, know. If you bootstrap 
the same ciphertext multiple times, you will have the same ciphertext in output. I, it it yeah, will not change. It will be always the same. There is no repetition. Like there is no so, so, different ciphertext that come out. Yeah, so let's say I'll take zero and, and let's say, let, let's assume that I can uh, uh, publicly uh, encrypt it into uh, an uh, encrypted uh, zero. Yes. And now I do best by a bootstrap and get one out of this uh, 250 symbols. And then I yes. do it again, 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 and again. Yeah. And then I'll get the entire 250 symbol uh, ciphertext that's encoded zero. Uh, zero. Yes. But isn't isn't that breaks the the, the encryption? Because I can no, see. Why? I mean, you know that you are encrypting zero. Yeah, but but what what I want to, to know is to to learn is that the polynomial v that has the encryption the polynomial v has 250 encryption of zero, right? I mean, the polynomial V is in clear, it's given in clear in input. So you know already that there are 250 values of, uh, of zero. Like this is, this is clear, it's not encrypted. Mm -hmm. It's given in clear, oh. is rotated by a B value that is known. And then you start the blind rotation. So you know exactly what are the values inside. You can, if you want, encrypt the polynomial V but then you don't know what is inside the polynomial V. Maybe you want to evaluate a, um, a private function. So you might encrypt the polynomial V. And so you will give it encrypted. But like when you will see the output coming, if you're, the output will be always encrypted. So if you didn't know what was V, and if you don't know what is M, you will not know what is in output in here. Like everything will be hidden. So if you know V in the beginning and you know that the cipher testing is encrypting zero, you will know that in output we will have an encryption of zero because this is the functionality of bootstrapping. But if your cipher, your V vector is encrypted at the beginning, which is something that can be done, and you start rotating by a quantity that you don't know what is this quantity, you will not know what is the output because it's encrypted. So if you are able to know what is inside, which means that you are opening the ciphertext is because you have the secret key. Does this answer uh, okay. to your question? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand during the bootstrap where comes the, the additional noise that hides the, the, the output. Uh, it comes from the bootstrapping keys. Mm -hmm. So you see in this operation, you have the bootstrapping key that enters and the bootstrapping key has some noise. And mm -hmm. the fact that you are doing operation with the bootstrapping keys will add the noise of the bootstrapping key together. And so at the end, the noise, of course, will be less than the beginning because you're starting from something, uh, uh, from, from some clear text, let's say. But every time you do an operation, the noise will increase. So the noise will be added and it will protect your information. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, let's see. Thanks. Thank you for the question. Is there any uh, other questions? Guys, if you have questions, because we see a lot of questions in the chat, uh, it's it's uh, sometimes easier if you just ask them directly. Uh, this is a very friendly room, huh? so just unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, and if you want to be extra friendly, you can also put up your camera so that uh, you know there's yeah. a face-to-face -face interaction. So is there any other question before I continue? Uh, or if you don't want to put your camera and still ask a question, you can do it. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, Ilaria, do you have uh, more stuff to present today? Uh, it's very quickly. It's going to be just a conclusion. So if you want, I will finish. So I'm, I stayed in the one hour and a half, and then yeah. we okay, can continue great. with questions. Yeah. Finish and then we'll take the other questions as well. Great. We yeah, let's do this. So it's going to be very quick. It's actually just a, a conclusion because, like, I, I would love to talk more about TFHE, but two hours will be not uh, will be not enough. So maybe another time. Um, so just to 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 finish uh, everything. Uh, to put a conclusion on this thing. Um, we saw a little bit TFHE. So you, you had an initial, let's say, deep dive into TFHE. 
Uh, if you want to experiment with TFHE, there exist uh, implementations, open source implementation. So of course, the original TFHE implementation is available on GitHub. Uh, the TFHE implementation on GitHub implements only bootstrap the binary gates. Uh, so you can build the binary circuit homomorphically. Um, and there exists also an experimental repository on which the circuit bootstrapping is implemented, but again, is dealing with binary, uh, binary plain texts. Um, a more recent implementation is uh, Concrete, which is developed here at Zama. Um, so Concrete is uh, implementing, of course, TFHE. It's implementing more functionality. So we have the programmable bootstrapping, uh, the binary integer and real uh, encodings are possible. And there is also a module that does noise tracking. So it's kind of helping you understand the, when you should be aware that the noise is growing too much. Um, and there are other, other also other functionalities that are uh, that are encoded, uh, implemented. Uh, there exist also GPU implementations, open source, uh, as instance, new FHE and QFHE are, are two examples. And I suppose there exists other implementation as well, but those ones are the, the first one uh, that came into my mind, at least. Um, so talking about applications, I will just make a quick list uh, and uh, will not go into detail. Uh, TFHE is uh, used already to do e-voting. You can use it to do multi-key encryption. So as somebody asked before, yes, we can do multi-key with TFHE. It's, not, uh, it's implemented actually in, in open source on GitHub, but it's like a, a proof of concept implementation that just to show um, that it works. Uh, but multi -key, uh, the multi-key version of TFHE exists. Uh, you can also use TFHE to, uh, in a multi-party computation scenario if you want, and uh, you can do machine learning um, and, uh, and many more applications that we don't have. I mean, there's no much space and uh, yeah, it can be used in many, many different ways. Uh, and uh, maybe something that is, uh, that is interesting is that uh, the a TFHE solution uh, based solution uh, was the winning solution in the two past years of the IDASH competition. So the IDASH competition is a competition uh, that um, concerns the homomorphic evaluation of uh, neural networks. So in the last two years, 2019 and 2020, two solutions based on TFHE won the competition. Um, and yeah, I think that's, uh, that's all. I just put a little bit of biography in here for those that are interested. Of course, if you want to know more about FHE or TFHE, feel free to ask me. And uh, I think this is all I wanted to say. And uh, I already took like one hour and a half. So thanks for resisting until uh, here, if you did. And um, of course, if there are any other questions, I will be more than happy to, to answer. Thank you very much. I don't see the chat, so, um, or maybe yes. Yes, I see the chat actually. Um, but there are many, many questions. So I will, I will ask somebody to, to, I mean, to unmute and ask me the questions if you have. Hello? Maybe I'm just going to steal a question from Justine Paul. Uh, how does the concrete library padding and precision kind of things map to the TFHE scheme and the encoding you described here, which is something I'm wondering yeah. as well, which is why I'm stealing it from chat. Okay, so uh, I, I was very quick uh, on this. Um, uh, so uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so in concrete, we have uh, this padding and precision um, yes. as so in, encoding, yeah. right? How does that map to the sort of math description that you gave for TFHE here? Okay, so the padding is kind of necessary if you want to bootstrap. So I, I kept this under the carpet. Uh, you will pardon me <laughs> for this. It was just to easy the, the explanation, but yes. One bit of padding is necessary. Uh, so in practice, this means that we can encode the information only in half of the torus. So TFHE already has this, and Concrete is doing exactly the same. So again, I put it under the carpet, but it's uh, something that should be said in the presentations. Um, and the other one was, so the padding and... I guess precision, right? Because the precision, of course. in Concrete, it's called something slightly different, right? OK, yes. Um, 
so, so precision, I, I mean, it depends also on the parameter choice. Maybe I can ask somebody of concrete to tell you more. <laughs> they may give you a better answer than I, than I do. So, um, hi. So um, Damien is speaking. Yes. Yeah, uh, in uh, in concrete, there is this uh, layer uh, crypto API, and we uh, try to keep uh, track of the precision as well as the noise and um, also the bits of padding present in uh, the ciphertext at any moment. So does it answer the question? Um, I guess mostly. Maybe it's a, like I have some more technical questions about the encoding thing, but I think that's not for here. <laughs> OK. Thanks, Damien. Uh, by, by the way, Alex uh, uh, will be presenting uh, uh, the next or the next after now uh, FHE meetup. He is going to be presenting uh, uh, FHE compilers, right, Alex? Yep. Uh, tools and compilers uh, for fully one encryption and how they sort of help you and sometimes don't. <laughs> Great. Uh, so that should be also quite interesting. So more, more practical. So I think one, one of the things about homomorphic encryption is there is a lot of theory but the implementations uh, also require making a lot of different choices and makes it more practical. Um, so I think it's interesting also to have sessions that are more on the implementation to explain how these things actually happen in practice. Uh, so really looking forward to that. Uh, anybody has any questions? Oh, I have a question, but the blind okay. rotate algorithm. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the during the blind rotate algorithm, we have to um, discretize the uh, coefficients of the L W L W ciphertext into a some uh, uh, into a um, n smaller yeah. integers than n. Mm -hmm. So that discretization add is as a significant amount of noise and yeah. i'm curious about how um how tfhg or sama came up i came over the additional errors that comes from the discretization sure um so uh, it's something that we actually call drift uh, so it's the error due to the discretization. So as you see like here, maybe in the slides is not super clear, but like what happens is that uh, you just take the most significant bit when you do the, the bootstrap, right? And so this means that actually you're cutting the, the tail, um, the, the last part, and this operation will add some noise. Uh, so this noise amount, uh, this additional noise amount can be estimated. And so the idea is that before you enter the bootstrapping, you are, sh I mean, how can I say? Uh, you will be, you will make sure that the noise at the input of the bootstrapping is able to still support this amount of noise added by the discretization. So you will bootstrap a little bit earlier than expected in order to be able to um, also have space for this additional amount of noise that is added by the, the truncation, by the, the surrounding. And uh, so this will not um, bother you during the bootstrapping. Is oh, this you. answering your question? Yes, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you for the question. So maybe just a quick additional comment on that. Uh, the, the, the drift is something that we're actively working on um, counterbalancing and uh, Concrete will be uh, offering some additional features in the near future that will give you much more precision in the programmable bootstrapping than what you can actually get today. Uh, we, we literally cannot talk about it now, but uh, uh, when, when this comes out, we'll make an announcement on the group as well because I think it's going to be a pretty significant update. Thank you. Um, would, it be, would, <clears throat> would it be like something hmm, setting the coefficients of a, a coefficient with um, the power of n or something like that? Um, um, in, in, initially setting the random um, numbers into a uh, some multiplication of n, <laughs> something like that. Uh, uh, I, I, I did not understand the question, but I would say that for the new things, 
I, I will I will prefer to keep a little bit of suspense, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. But again, you know, as, as everything we do at Zama, it's eventually going to be published in open source. Though. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Very soon, probably. Nothing we do is kept secret. Uh, everything eventually gets published in open source, but it's, uh, you know, there, there, there's, a, there's a right time to do it, and that's going to be soon. Mm -hmm. so I hope the secret keys are kept secret, right? Sorry again. No, I... Hello. Yeah, it's just not a funny joke. I hope the secret is. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear it, <laughs> but I suppose it was funny. I, I thought it was funny actually. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, I mean, I had another question. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Sure. I uh, asked in chat before, but maybe that was overlooked. So uh, I have a question regarding the application to machine learning. So you mentioned that, yes. that it's possible with TFHE to do some machine learning applications. Yes. And I would think usually you would take something like BFV, a seal library, right? So something that's mm -hmm. based on, on integers because machine learning needs many linear operations. So how mm -hmm. does it compare in performance with TFHE? Okay, so um, maybe let's let's reset a little bit the scenario. So you you cited BGV, BFV. Uh, I don't. Rem I mean, one of the two. Um, so um, as I explained in the beginning, the BGV and BFV um, scenarios can uh, schemes can do bootstrapping, but the bootstrapping is very very costly. So they will prefer to do a, to use a leveled approach. Uh, so they will do leveled operations, so they will avoid doing bootstrapping if possible. So um, in machine learning, of course, depending on the on the neural network that you want to evaluate, you will have more or less layers. So if you have a very little amount of layers, uh, maybe some of their approach uh, can be useful. Um, especially, I'm thinking about so the linear operation, of course, can be done by linear operations. And then when you have the activation function, they will try to evaluate it by approximating the function to a polynomial, let's say. So this will consume uh, layers of multiplication, which means the levels in practice. Um, and so you will stick into, um, into the number of levels that you allow to, to use uh, a, a very limited amount of operations, so a very limited amount of layers. If you want to go deeper, you need to do bootstrapping. And in TFHE, the bootstrapping is extremely fast. So in TFHE, as you saw, you can do linear operations because you can do the addition and the multiplication by constants in every, of, every one of the three ciphertexts I showed you. Uh, and then for the nonlinear layers, like the activation function layers, you will actually use bootstrapping. So in the bootstrapping, as I said, you can not only reduce the noise, but you can also evaluate a function. So in practice, what we do when, when we evaluate a, um, an activation function is that we, we use bootstrapping to evaluate this function. So in practice, the, the message M that enters in the um, activation function um, will be output as f of n, where f is the activation function itself. So you will, you will evaluate the activation layers by doing bootstrapping and the other layers by just doing leveled additions and uh, constant multiplications. And in this case, you don't have any more the, the depth limitation that you have the, in the leveled approach because you can bootstrap as much as you can and so potentially go as deep as you can. And uh, we saw in, in a recent paper, a few, um, uh, a few experiments, uh, we were able to evaluate as instance neural network with uh, 20, 50, and 100 uh, layers in uh, a bunch of seconds, I would say. D don't ask me the exact time as they are in the paper, but it was on the order of a few seconds. Okay, and uh, so the linear layers, they will be approximately as fast as with BFV or is, is that comparable? The, the uh, I, I would say yes, like a linear layers are just additions between LWEs or ring LWEs. So in, in BFV, I, they use uh, ring LWEs, so it's additions and multiplications between ring LWEs. So uh, addition and constant multiplication between ring LWEs. So I would say that the cost is uh, about the same. Of course, it depends on the parameter choice. Generally, BFV, BGV has the tendency to use SIMD packing to evaluate many things at the same time. So they, they use uh, quite large parameters, I would say, 
uh, with TFHE, you use uh, smaller parameters because you evaluate like a single input. But of course, like it depends on the parameterization. But I would say that at same parameter choices, it will be it will be the same. TFHE generally has the tendency to choose smaller parameters because uh, we're able to evaluate uh, evalu operations with smaller parameters. Does this answer okay. your question? Yeah, a, a little bit, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So, but there's no CIMD in in TFHE then. Which uh, is, is the thing that makes yeah not just SIMD no but if yeah. I mean SIMD is very yes we don't have SIMD in the traditional way as we intend the SIMD I suppose like with the slots um, in TFHE yeah. you can use packing in the polynomial packing by putting many messages in the coefficients of Ringel W which can be used in certain application like the lookup table evaluation um, that I did not explain in this presentation. Um, but yeah, generally we pack a single um, message into a LWE. So the SIMD packing can be interesting in case you want to evaluate like uh, a neural network in many inputs at the same time. Uh, but if you have a single request by a user, uh, well, you have to put one single message in all the slots. So you're a little bit wasting a space. Um, if you instead need to do just one single evaluation, I mean, one ciphertext, one ciphertext encrypting one message is uh, sufficient. Um, so SIMD, it's, it's useful sometimes, but not all the time, I would say. Yeah. Okay, Did thanks I... a lot. Yeah. Great presentation. So follow up on that one. It's uh, Ricard Bramwell here. Um, I uh, so, but there is some support for same type of operations. You can, I did I understand correctly that you can you can pack and then you can add numbers. Uh, you can pack in Ringel WE and you can do additions in Ringel WE, but the packing is polynomial packing. So it's it's slightly different. So the, the packing I got, think Philip um, I think was asking. Uh, is called SIMD, so it's um, it's working in the Fourier domain. Uh, so you're you're kind of doing parallel operations in all the plain text um, by moving to this slot space. Let's say with polynomials, you can do polynomial operation, which is slightly different. So a, a, a pa is a different kind of packing. For linear operations like additions and constant multiplication, is um, it's sufficient uh, um, the the polynomial packing, so you will be able to do the same operation. Uh, for multiplication, could, it's slightly um, different. But you could do something like um, adding numbers and uh, uh, sorry, pack adding numbers. Adding multiple numbers at the same time. Pa uh, pad, uh, pack numbers and then then add uh, add multiple sort of same style uh, representations and then do a lookup table selection on it. Yes, so to do the lookup table selection, so uh, yes, you can do, you can pack into a ring LW, maybe I will go on the slides. You can pack into a ring LW many messages because you can encrypt a polynomial. So in every coefficient of the polynomial, we, you will put one of the messages you want to pack. And then you can do yet yeah, the addition, the constant multiplication. So the linear operations, you can do it, them in parallel by packing into a ring LW. But then when you want to evaluate an activation function, you need to extract the elements into a LWE in order to evaluate the bootstrap, the programmable bootstrapping that allows you to evaluate the activation function. And then you okay. can, of course, repack again if you want, because you can kiss. Oh, sorry. You can uh, key switch back to Ring LWE. So you can pack, uh, unpack, repack uh, easily if okay. necessary. Okay. Uh, a little bit related to that, I think that Pascal might already have answered my question in the chat, but um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll ask. A anyway, um, I thought this um, lookup table idea, um, I understand then that. Let's say that you wanted to do something like um, that is not one to one. You're not evaluating something like the uh, pre-calculated exponential, but you're doing something more like a comparison. So let's say that you want to do a, a lookup table only on the the most significant bit. Would you be able to do that more efficiently than than just uh, making a lookup table for for all your uh, sort of message encoding bits? Well, I, I suppose if you want to just keep the most, most significant bit, it's just a matter of encoding the right lookup table. 
right you could do it as a lockup table but but then you would have to take like um, uh, let's say that you, you you're encoding uh, two bits so you have zero to three so you would mm -hmm. make a lookup table let's say that zero and one maps to zero mm -hmm. and one and two maps to ones yes but that could also be expressed as a lookup table on yeah, only sure. the most significant bit so i was yeah. wondering if it's more efficient to to, to and, and if it's possible to do it that way so it's possible to do it that way yes uh, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, you, I mean, the fact that you have more repetition, like you have only the most significant bit, so you have less information, might allow you to reduce the size of the parameters, but you have to be very careful. You have, I mean, take my answer with the, uh, uh, as a very, let's say, um, uh, informal answer. You might, uh, adapt to the parameters, but need to be careful. Yeah, no, I, it's, uh, I, I think I need to read up more to understand it, but it seems like it might might be possible. To it might it be by... more efficient, effectively, but in, yeah. in any case, it's possible. Might be more efficient just because you're bootstrapping less information. But again, be careful with this. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. And uh, sorry for, uh, for, for taking no, more thank time. You. That was thank you for the questions. Thanks a lot. Um, I have some questions on concrete library. Um, yes. Um, like um, the bootstrapping part, um, like uh, when you create a bootstrapping key, it it needs a base log level. How, how does all those things uh, relate to the things that you talked just now? Oh, yes. So the base log and the, um, and the level, I keep them a little bit under the carpet, but you saw them appearing at some point. Uh, I tell you exactly what they are. Um, let me go back for a second, maybe here. So you remember the decomposition part, or maybe I, I can go even a little bit more back in the ring JSW part. So you remember that in here, in the ciphertext, you are encrypting the message time S times this Q over beta to the J. Mm -hmm. So beta is the base. So base log is uh, the logarithm of beta. And L is the level. And when you do the composition, uh, you're decomposing with respect to, uh, maybe it's very small to see it, but you're decomposing with respect to beta and L, which are the base, two to the power of base log, and L, which is uh, the levels that you see in the implementation. So uh, they are parameters that are, they are important for the decomposition part. So the decomposition, of course, is used in the, in the product ring JSW, but also in the external product. And the external product is used in the CMUX. Uh, so this means that those two parameters will impact in practice all the operations that you're doing, apart from linear operation, I would say. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. I will stop moving between slides. I will I will wait for questions to move. Okay. Guys, maybe maybe let's take a couple more questions. Then uh, we're probably going to wrap it up. It's been uh, almost two hours. Yes. Um, <laughs> if you want, by the way, to ask more questions, you know, we're very we're very easy to find. Uh, we're a privacy company that actually is very open and transparent. It sounds a little bit uh, counterintuitive. Uh, but we love to talk about these things. It doesn't have to be just at a meetup. You can reach out to us uh, anytime. Mm -hmm. um, any any final question? Anybody has like a very pressing question? Hello, no, can you hear me? Yeah, we can yes. hear you. Uh, I have a question. So, in concrete library, how can I uh, use in uh, in the encode? For example, how to select the padding number? Yeah, how to, how can I select the padding? So that's which one, uh, which number that I can padding it? Yeah, I mean that if I use encode, uh, there is a encode a uh, encoder API here, API here, and then the here is the number of padding. 
Um, for, for, for questions about concrete specifically, so, so today was really more about the TFHC uh, tier. Oh. For concrete oh. specifically, yes. there's a lot of implementation details, which I think go beyond the scope of today and uh, are actually super mm -hmm. interesting to discuss, quite frankly. Um, if, if you have a question, uh, you can email concrete at zama.ai. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll get back to you. Uh, we'll get back to you with the, with the answers. Uh, we also have a couple of papers out which might partly address that. But yeah, just shoot us an email about concrete. Uh, let's try to keep today about the theory only. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe in that case, I have another question. Um, sure. So we've seen the external product and we've seen programmable bootstrapping today. And I know how to multiply to ciphertext together with, with like a lookup table via some squaring sort of, you know, exercises. Yes. I didn't put it in the slide, but yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. You also didn't put it in documentation, by the way, <laughs> if I remember correctly. So that, Wait, Which documentation, sorry? Uh, concrete, <laughs> like, yeah, that's- ah, uh, I didn't cite concrete in I don't, the- I don't know, I'm, I'm just, you know, poking okay. some fun here, Damien. Oh, like, okay. It should really be in the documentation. That's how you do multiplication. That took us a day to figure out. But yeah, so I know how to do it like with lookup table based bootstrapping, but now I wonder how did you do multiplication or end gates in like the non PBS versions? Um... So in the gate bootstrapping? Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, uh, the gate bootstrapping is, uh, maybe to explain it, I can go to the, to the bootstrapping part. Uh, just give me one second. Um, so in the gate bootstrapping, what you're trying to evaluate is uh, um, a gate, uh, which is in practice a, a function. Uh, so what you will do, like the number of messages that you encode is just two. In gate bootstrapping, you encode them in a, in a very special way. You encode them in minus one over eight and one over eight. Um, and then you do like an addition or a linear combination initially, and then you evaluate the bootstrapping. So in the gate bootstrapping, a, the linear initial combination is taking care of the linear part of the gate. And then with the bootstrapping, you're taking care of the nonlinear part of the gate. So in practice, what you do with gate bootstrapping is just linear combination and a bootstrapping. And the bootstrapping is just in the same way as here, uh, a lookup table that is encoding two possible output values. And okay, yep. uh, yeah, that's it. So it's still basically programmable bootstrapping. It's just much like, you know, much less interesting. Uh, it's, it's, it's much easier, I would say, because it's just like a, a very simple lookup table. Let's say mm -hmm. if you want to yeah. evaluate more complex lookup table, then you will have more values. But um, yes, I mean, in the end, it's a bootstrapping. Uh, bootstrapping is always composed by um, modulo switching, which is under the carpet when you do the rounding up to the most significant bit, the blind rotation, as you're seeing in here, and uh, the final key switching if necessary. So uh, in the gate bootstrapping, there's just a little additional uh, initial um, linear combination, but it's uh, uh, cost almost nothing compared to the bootstrapping. So a gate bootstrapping cost as a bootstrapping. Of course, since you have just one bit of information that you're bootstrapping, you can choose the smallest parameter possible. So it's gonna be very fast. As soon as you start evaluating more complex functions, so you need to store more information inside, your parameters grow a little bit, but uh, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Thank you for the question. All right, let's keep it at here for today. Ilaria, thank you very, very much. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, our thank next uh, homomorphic encryption meetup will be probably in May. Alex, who was just asking the question, will be presenting uh, the stuff he's been working on around tools and compilers for homomorphic encryption. Um, so looking forward to talk to everyone again then. And until then, have a great time and uh, enjoy the rest of your day or evening. Thanks everyone for, for resisting until here. <laughs> and thanks Rand for, uh, for inviting me to, to this session. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.